Hello, we're here. Welcome to Facebook Live. I'm just finding my way around this platform and looking forward to having some folks show up. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, if you're here and you can make a note in the comment, let me know if the sound is working, that'd be great. Um, and so I'm really glad that everyone can be here. Hello, Jillian. Um, glad that people can join. And so welcome folks who are joining in line. Hey, Steve from the UK, that's great. Uh, welcome people who are joining in the moment and also the replay visitors. Yes, the sound is great. Good. Great. Welcome. Okay. And someone says, which time zone is there? I'm thinking you figured that out by now. That's great. So thanks so much for joining. My name is Sarah Kerr and I am a death doula and I am really committed to my work and really thrilled about helping grow this movement and helping more people step into this because we do such a poor job of meeting death in general. There's some little pockets where we do it well, but mostly as a culture, we don't meet it so well. And we need a lot more people to do this. So I'm hoping in the next hour or so, I can really share with you some of my experiences and talk a bit about what I do and how I do it. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about me and then I'd love to know a bit about you and who's here and we'll just proceed from there. So my practice is in Calgary. I have been in practice now for about four and a half years and it's incredible. I, I never thought that I would be able to do work that I find so meaningful, that so deeply touches who I am. And I'm so grateful to my clients and my students. I do a lot of teaching too for helping me develop this. There's a big spectrum of what death midwifery is and what a death doula can do. And in that spectrum, my focus is really on ceremonial work. So I'm supporting people with rituals and primarily rituals that are nature-based and, and soul-focused rather than rituals within a particular religious tradition. And I also teach, I teach students here in Calgary and I mentor and I host community gatherings. Excuse me, sorry. Ah, uh, something, just some funny thing over happened over there. Welcome to Facebook Live. It's informal. I'm, I'm trying to make the noises go away and I think it worked. So I, uh, I host community gatherings. So I'm going to talk more about me and my background later, but I'll talk a bit about the session and what we're going to do here. So people contact me all the time and they're curious about what death, mid death midwifery is and what I do and how I got to do what I do. There's a whole bunch of questions people ask. And it's, I think it's really related to the fact that death is such a shadowed topic. If there's anything that we push away in our culture that we don't allow ourselves to see, it gets a lot of energy around it. And then when we lift the lid up a little bit, we make space for it and everything comes rushing through. So people are pretty interested in what death midwifery is and how it works. And one of the things that happens is in this culture, we push away the gifts of people who are called to deal with death. In a culture that's so death phobic and so afraid really of facing the natural and normal part of life that death is, we push away death and we, we don't really even want to talk to people who are dealing with death. So lots of people, my mentoring clients and my students come to me and say, my friends all think I'm weird. They think I'm the macabre one. They think I'm strange or gloomy or dark and they don't want to talk about what I want to talk about. And it's a real tragedy because we need people who can talk about death and who are drawn to work with death and are called to it. So I'm, as I said, really committed to supporting people and growing this movement. What I'm going to talk about a bit today is my life as a death doula, what I do, how I do my work. And I'll also at the end tell you a little bit about an online course I've developed, which is quite a short introduction, but it answers those questions in a bigger way that I can do in one video. So that gives you a bit of a handle of where we're going. I'd love to hear a bit from folks out there. What are you curious about? What kind of questions? Looking forward to taking the course soon. That's great, Holly. Yeah, I've been really thrilled with the turnout and the um, people showing up for the course. There's lots of folks interested and I've had really good feedback. So in terms of what I'm gonna focus on today, any questions people have, anything specific that you 
would like me to, to really be sure to address because I want to make sure this is useful to you as possible. And as you're thinking about comments and questions, I'll just remind you to um, want to take your course. That's great. Thanks, Jillian. Uh, I'll remind you to comment now. And also, if you're listening during the replay, you can comment then and I'll come back and answer them all. And if you're thinking about this and curious and you have other people in your world who might be curious, consider sharing the post or forwarding it to them or inviting them to it either now or afterwards. It's really important that we broaden the, the base of people who have these skills. Okay, so if you have any questions, just pop them up on the screen and I will address them. And I, I'm gonna talk a bit and then we'll stop for a bigger section of Q&A. So what is deaf midwifery? It's a big question. It doesn't really have a fixed answer. Oh, here's the time lag. Okay, Holly says, how did you begin your death doula journey? And Jeremy says, could you tell me more about your nature-based spiritual approach? Perfect. Uh, thanks for both of those. I will, I will definitely address both of those. I'm going to talk right now a bit about the journey, and in a little bit I'm going to talk about rituals and how I bring the nature-based part into it. And Jillian says, okay, lots of questions. How do people find out about you and your services? And... How much of your work is a psychopomp? Okay, I got lots of questions there to, um, to deal with, and I will make my way through those. Can you speak a little bit about the spiritual component? Okay, I will do all of those. Because it's, it's such a new field, there's so many questions in it. So what is death midwifery? It's an overarching social phenomenon, probably is a way to describe it. It's... Um, it's a lay movement that's growing alongside what's happening in mainstream institutions about how we need death. So within palliative care and medical systems, there's lots of innovation happening and people are finding new and better ways to meet death. So the death midwifery movement is, is the parallel to that that's happening outside the mainstream institutions. It's lay people in their communities who are being drawn to become more comfortable with death to become more comfortable with their own death and to support their friends and family. And it's, it's popping up in lots of different places. I can't tell you how many people have told me they thought they invented the term death doula or death midwife because it just seems so normal to put those two together when in fact it's really been invented in the minds of many, many people. There's something it speaks to in the culture that's coming forward. So it's a, it's both a new movement and a very old one. It's a traditional skill that's re-emerging. All our ancestors, and we come from long, long lines of people who are, who are used to living close to the land, living in tight communities, and living close to the mysteries of life and death. And we have, in the last few generations, really separated ourselves from those. We've made it the purview of experts. We've handed it off, partly because we don't necessarily have the skills, we don't know how to deal with it emotionally or practically. And death midwifery is about the reemergence and the resurrection of some of that traditional knowledge. And we live in quite a death illiterate society. So it's, it's a relearning we have to do. We've forgotten something, but it's in our DNA, in our spiritual DNA, to know how to meet death well. We need to relearn that. And as I say, this death midwifery movement is, is a big movement that has lots of different aspects within it. So when people say, I want to be a death doula, the next thing they often say is, oh, what exactly is a death doula? Because that definition is still finding itself. Different people are doing different things all within that umbrella. My guess is that in 10 years, we'll have a much clearer picture. The movement will have sorted itself out, we'll have some specialties, we'll have some niches, we'll have some more descriptive terms. But right now we're at the beginning and it's exciting to be at the beginning. It's exciting to be part of shaping this, but part of being at the beginning is knowing that it's still unformed and a little bit slippery. So um, I wanna speak a bit to a question I get often about the relationship between death midwifery and professional 
end of life care support workers, social workers, nurses, funeral directors. And my perspective on this is that we're all on the same team and I have really deep respect for people who are doing that work. And they're specializing and they have lots of training and expertise. And they're focusing on these parts that they are particularly focused on and we need them. And we also need a bigger umbrella where it's happening at the dinner table and when we visit our grandmother in the nursing home and when we talk to our friends that we develop a wider literacy within the culture. And also I think there's real opportunity to grow different kinds of services that maybe aren't so institutionalized and structured in that way. But I really see a lot of overlap and, and for this movement to progress well, I think we have to be working really closely in conjunction with people who are already in that field. And, and not everybody has access to all those things all the time. And hospice social workers do a lot of what could be considered death midwifery, but not everybody has access to hospice or is there or maybe has access to the breadth of time you might want with a social worker. So hopefully there's a way to, to balance those so that the lay movement grows up in conjunction with the formal and professional uh, practitioners. The thing about this lay movement is that there's an archetypal pattern in us to, just like there are people who are called to be artists, called to be musicians, called to be builders, called to be business people, called to be all the different paths we can have in life. The path of being a, a person who walks with death is a, is a human path to follow. And it's emerging, it's waking up in us. Somebody mentioned the word psychopomp, spelled P-S-Y-C-H-O. And it comes from psyche, which means soul. And the Greek roots of the word psyche are that soul and butterfly are the same thing. So psyche means butterfly in Greek and soul in English. Those are the roots. And pomp means guide. So a psychopomp is a guide of souls. And there's a kind of archetype of people who know the way from this world to the other. There are also spiritual psychopomp beings who navigate a different aspect of that. But this, this archetype is emerging in people. And I think it's really useful for folks to know that because sometimes you don't know why you're called to it. Your brain can't really make sense of it. You just feel something inside you that is drawn to be with dying people and their families or to follow these tracks of interesting paths on the internet around it or to read about it. And that's an archetypal awakening that is something your soul is asking for. So just follow it because there is a big force, there's a logic, there's a coherence to that, that your brain may take a while to catch up with because we don't have a lot of structures here in this culture to support that. It's really a calling, it's a vocation for people who are called to it. I wanna talk a little bit about um, this as a profession, as a paid profession and as an unpaid service of the community. And I really hold the, we could call it death literacy, the capacity to be with death as a, as a fundamental human skill that we really should all have a little bit of and some people in our communities will have more. It's like gardening or you know, the ability to grow your own food or maybe carpentry, the ability to fill your house, build your house. We all are, are better off if we know at least something about it. And usually there's a couple of people in a family or in the neighborhood or on the block who are really good at it. You got some bug on your rose bush, boy, you can go down. I go down and talk to Roxy down the street. She knows about my rose bush bugs. So we, we share that knowledge in our communities. And let's take gardening. So I can garden a little bit. Roxy knows more about it. There's a call-in show at noon hour uh, on the CPC radio in Alberta. There's someone who's even more of, an, of a, uh, an expert. I just hear someone say, I've lost video and audio. Is everybody else okay on that? Anybody else having problems with video and audio? Well, there's a bit of a lag. So if anybody is, let me know. Other than that, Jeremy, sorry, I'm not sure about that. It looks okay from here. So gardening is uh, 
is something that we have different levels of expertise in. And occasionally you might hire a landscaper to come and do your garden. Okay, great. Says that the video and audio is great. So I see this as a bit in that progression, that it's something that we need local skills for, and there's value to having people who really put their attention into it and get deeper and deeper and deeper. So that's one picture. The other picture is that it's a big job to relearn these things. And sometimes it doesn't happen just in the informal way. We need people who say, okay, this is what I'm going to devote my life to. This is my work. This is why I'm here. And they go deeper into it. And there's some logic to getting paid for that. And if that's really what you're going to bring to the world, your gift, then it's an exchange of energy. And so getting paid for it is useful and beneficial for both sides. We need, I, I'm really clear that we don't want it only as a paid profession. We want it much wider than that, but that having paid professionals is really useful because people can go deeper and develop new patterns and new tools and new healing modalities. And sometimes people just need support. Some of this work takes a, a big team around you. And if you don't have a family or a community that has that kind of a team, having a paid professional can help do that. They can come in and they can give some expertise. So it's it's a fine line. And as I say, within a decade or so, we'll probably have it figured out. More people will know about it informally in their families. And we'll have figured out what the balance is between paid and non-paid folks doing this work. So uh, I want to talk about what it can look like. And there's a huge spectrum of possibilities. You know, this gets back to what I said before when people say, what's a death doula? Well, it can be anything in this umbrella of death midwifery. So some folks are working with bedside work. Maybe they're doing aromatherapy or different kinds of healing modalities, supporting people who are really in their last days. Other people are doing things that are more preparatory and logistical, helping organize wills, helping figure out what to do with all the sentimental items in your house, helping people navigate the paperwork aspect of it. Others are hosting workshops to build your own coffin. The list goes on and on and on. And as I mentioned before, I have this course and I've put a ton of resources in there about that. But I just want to give you the sense that the spectrum is really wide. And in that frame, my focus is on ritual. So I help people with some of those other things, but mostly what I do in those is refer them to other people. So um, I have a colleague in town who was a palliative care nurse for many years. She now has a private practice as a kind of palliative ombudsman, you might call it. So if someone is in a, a healthcare system and they're having trouble, they don't feel like they're getting the care they need, they don't understand what their doctor's saying, there's all sorts of challenges that can happen when people are in care. That's not my area of expertise. The medical terminology, the um, biological processes, that's not my area of expertise, but it is hers. So when people call me and they say, oh, I think my mother wants to stop eating, but they're still feeding her, I refer them to my friend and she supports them in that. And then when they're ready to say goodbye and they need a ritual, she refers them back to me. And when they need help with their will, I refer them to other colleagues. And it comes back and forth. So knowing if you're interested in this, that there's a big spectrum and bringing your own gifts to it are, is really the way to proceed. And so I'll, uh, I'll stop there. I'm going to talk some more about ritual and particularly about what I do. Um, and I'm going to roll back here. There's a bit of a lag um, and see some of the questions. Okay, so Jeremy... Jeremy says, do you meet with other death doulas in your area to support each other? Absolutely. In fact, I host a group called the Calgary Holistic Death Network because so many people call me and say, I want to talk about doing this work. And we meet monthly and we have a guest speaker from the community. So people will talk about all sorts of different aspects of death and dying. We've had people talk about uh, psychedelic drug therapy at end of life. Um, First Nations approaches to death and dying with the Threshold Choir, which is a bedside singing group come in. We, we meet monthly. We've had lots of speakers 
And we have both a, a learning aspect and then a networking aspect. And it's really important for people to talk to each other. You know, there's a saying, it takes a village to die well. Well, it takes a village to create a death revolution. And we're really trying to change how things happen in Calgary and do it in a collaborative way. So people are finding partners for projects. Someone has an idea, they bring it to this group and they'll get folks to help them run a pilot project. It's really important, uh, this connection. And there are now groups starting that are like this. They have different names. They're run by different people. They have a different focus, but they're in general the same zone in lots of different communities. So, yeah, that's a big, important part of it. Let's see what's going. Someone, Christine says, do I run into any issues because I'm not a nurse? Uh, I hope I addressed that a little bit before. I'm not offering medical support, but it's really useful to me to have nurses in the world that I can refer people to. And I'm really clear about what I am offering. It took me a long time to get clear about what I am offering because I was just drawn to this big field. And it took me probably a couple of years at least to get it narrowed down to say, oh, I'm offering ritual. These are the people who probably want what I like, what I offer. They're, in general, my clients are midlife women who have a spiritual but not religious perspective. And they're interested in holistic healing modalities. And they probably go to yoga and have tried some Reiki. It's just kind of a demographic. That's one group that I work with. I would love to see death doulas who work with all sorts of different demographics of people. What I do and what I offer to the people who work with me is only one little wedge of it. We need people who work with all sorts of folks. So I think nursing or, or having that is not necessary if you get clear about what you offer. Carrie Lee says, how much of your doula work is psychopomp support? Can you speak a little bit about that, the spiritual component? So as I explained earlier, psychopomp, psyche and pomp, guide of souls. Psychopomps, either as human support or as a kind of spiritual support, know the path between this world and the other. They can guide people across. And that looks different in every culture. Every culture has a framework for how to do that. and. Um, in Western culture, in the sort of, we could call it the neo-shamanic movement. Shamanism isn't a word I use a lot, but it's, it's in the realm of what we're talking about. We have to qualify that quite carefully. But there are people who are training to do psychopomp work and people who just naturally are trained by the spirits to do that, who step in when souls are stuck or they need help across. That's not what I do. I feel like that one-on-one -on -one work is its own thing. I'm more interested in the collective work. So absolutely what I'm doing is psychopomp work, but I'm doing it through ritual and ceremony. So when I facilitate a ceremony with a family, we're together creating the energetic field. It's a kind of collective energetic medicine where we're creating the field and the, the, the ritual gesture is the energetic intervention that supports helping people get from one side to the other. In fact, I worked with a client family not long ago where the mother was, oh, I think she was in her late 80s, maybe even early 90s, and had, had quite advanced dementia for quite a while and just wasn't leaving. And they thought, is she stuck? What's up? And so we did a ceremony with the family and her to help open the gates and help her release, help lay the tracks for her journey from this world across to the far shore to where the ancestors lived, to the village of the ancestors. And we did it collectively. It wasn't me doing it. It was me creating the space and creating the, it's almost like being a conductor of an orchestra. People are there. They want to help. How do they get all their energies aligned up and in harmony so that we support the person? So that's before she needed a little help unhooking but also I do it afterwards. So the funeral work I do is really big psychopomp work. So again, that's, that's my angle on death doula work. Someone might never go near that, be really grounded in this world and be, being off, be offering great death midwifery support, but not so much into the spiritual realm. So it's really a wide spectrum. 
Sherilyn says, how do people find you and your services? Oh, Sherilyn, that's a pretty cute little baby you got there. I'm assuming that's your baby and not you. Um, mostly they find me through word of mouth. The field is not established enough yet that people wake up in the morning when someone is dying and think, I need a death joke. It's starting to happen, but mostly people have come to a funeral I've facilitated, come to a ceremony I've facilitated, and from that, they've heard about it, and they know, and they know, and it gets passed by word of mouth. So I really tell people, and I talk a lot about this in the course, really tell people that this is not, don't quit your day job yet. This is not a path that's an established career track where if you're interested in doing it as a paid professional, you can pay your bills tomorrow with it. It's, uh, oh, it's he's your grandson, Luke, says Cheryl. That's great, in the photo. It's, uh, it's a new field, and people need to learn that it exists as a possibility. So I'm not flooded by clients. I don't want to imply that this is a, a, a busy practice. I, I have a steady practice, but it's taken me a long time. And a big part of what I do is teaching. So they find me primarily through word of mouth. Holly says, how did you begin your death doula journey? Um, I'll answer that and tell you that it's important that it's, you don't see that this is how other people should do it. There's a huge spectrum of ways we can approach this work. And I talk about um, really coming to it through three different places. From a personal, from a professional, and from a political. And those three happen to rhyme, so that works. Or they, there's alliteration, they all start with a P. Personally, about seven or eight years ago now, seven and a half, my dad had a really bad stroke. And he went from being vigorous and strong and healthy and active to being flattened in a long-term care center with most of his cognitive ability still here, but his body half paralyzed and really debilitated and a little bit intellectually compromised too. But it was so fast and it was so shocking. And I was living in California at the time. I flew back. And anyone who's been through this process knows what a intense and overwhelming experience that is. I, um, I came back and as I sort of landed here and got my breath and realized what was happening, it became so clear to me that I hadn't been well prepared for this. That this is a normal part of living to meet illness and death. And I thought, well, he's not dead, but he's going to die. And I want to be more prepared when he is. And actually, he died April 5th, so a couple of months before this. Um, and I haven't thought about this in quite the same way, but I, when he had the stroke, I really made that vow that when he died, I'd be prepared. And I was. And I'll post the link in the comments or up above the, um, the video about the story of what happened when he died, because it really was a beautiful process. And we were prepared. So that was my personal path into it. Professionally and personally, I've, I've always been sensitive to the other worlds and that information has come easily to me. So dead people and living people aren't that different in my world. And I've done a lot of studying of different kinds of energetic and spiritual and shamanic healing modalities. So I've, I've had a long 15 or 20 years probably of those practices. So that was another kind of, um, aspect of what brought me to this. And the third was really political, that we are going through a, a death as a culture, society. We can't keep living the way we do. And we need to learn some skills for letting go because there's a lot of letting go we have to do in the next little while. And so I'm interested in helping people learn at a really personal level that people die and that we can survive it. And that there's new life after that. Because at the collective level, there are a lot of things that are going to have to die. Ways we've been used to living. Things that have been core to how we've identified ourselves that are going to go away. And we need skills to let go so we can continue on. So that's kind of the, the angle that I got into it. It brings all of those. Jeremy says, could you please share more about your nature-based? Is it shaman-based? I would say 
That's a big question. Um, there are different ways to talk about shamanism. You can talk about it anthropologically or you can talk about it archetypally. Anthropologically, we'd say, here's a community, here's a tradition, here's a culture. They have within their culture a, a person or, or a number of people who are shamans. We'll just use that word, although it is that's a particular culture, but let's say transculturally, we'll apply it transculturally. That's, that's an anthropological way. These are shamanic practices of this particular culture. The other way to talk about it is archetypally, that as I talked about earlier, it's a natural phenomena that grows up and wells up within us. And there are naturally in every culture, people who are walkers between the worlds. And so in that way, yes, what I'm doing is shamanic in the archetypal way. That in Western culture, it's been fairly repressed for a long time and oppressed in other cultures, certainly. And so we're having to find our way new into it. And we don't have the elders and the traditions and the mythology and the songs and the tools and the practices. So what I'm doing is really trying to help develop a new cultural model that meets the, the archetypal shamanic urge within us, shamanic force. Eh. But it pays really deep respect to existing cultures and honors the political issues that they're facing and the colonialism and the exploitation. So bigger question, but I, I certainly uh, dance around those questions a lot. And nature-based ceremonies were all descended from people who were land-based people who lived in small groups and worship nature as the sacred, the world, the living world around us. And so I go back to that. What is it to trust the forces of nature when someone's dying. And we develop rituals that um, connect around that. Let's see, what else? Okay, I hear lots of questions in there. Great, that looks like a bunch of, oh, we've got more questions in here. Ah, Carol, that's great. She says, I'm an end of life doula in, India, in Indianapolis, Indiana. Carol, maybe you could make a post. I'll talk a bit because it'll take a bit for it to come through, but maybe make a post and tell us a bit about what you do because I'd love to hear how others um, meet this. Holly says, I've started school to become an LPN, a licensed practical nurse. My desire is to work in palliative, hoping to combine death doula work and nursing. Do you think this is wise or should I keep the work separate? So that's where we have to say, well, what is death doula work? And we don't really have a definition for it. Death doula work is death midwifery, those are synonymous essentially, is supporting people and families through the end of life. Nurses are doing that, social workers are doing that, and there are lay people doing that in different ways. So I don't actually think there's a differentiation. It depends kind of what kind of death doula work you wanna do. If you wanna do work that's more like mine, that is more explicitly spiritual and really engages with the continuity of consciousness and the journey of the soul after death, well, then you have to figure out how that works with nursing because you have to respect the spiritual practices people are bringing in. So if you want to do that death doula work, well, then you have to ask those questions. If you want to do therapeutic touch and aromatherapy, then you say, oh, how does that fit with nursing? If you want to be supporting uh, people to organize their will and think about death and get prepared while they're still healthy, then that's another question. Will that fit with nursing? So I think the important thing is, is not to see death doula and death midwifery as a singular definition. It's, it's a big movement under which we're finding lots of approaches. So I can imagine a beautiful way that you could find ways to enhance the nursing work you do with the growing death midwifery movement and all that it's offering. And depending on what you choose, you may not be able to put those together or you may. So again, it's it's a big, it depends because that definition is so broad. So Allison says, while it would be great to come and study with you, what if since life or better said death is so unpredictable, what if I suddenly find my conf myself confronting a loved one's death? What are some quick death doula basics for the dying in the family? That's 
a hard question to answer because it's always different. It's like someone saying, what are some quick gardening basics? Well, weed and water. Well, maybe not even weed. Some people have a different approach to that, but water and sun, you know? So it all depends on what's happening in the family. So when I, and, and I, I'm going to try and give you some, some core guidance, but I, I really, it's a hard thing to do because when I walk into a family, when I get a call, I do a lot of phone consulting with people. It's about feeling into what's happening in this situation and what needs to shift in order to bring balance to this situation. So it's working with the energetic fields and the patterns that are in place. So sometimes someone is having problems saying goodbye. So then I do ritual work to support people say goodbye. Sometimes people have a, a need to have some closure around I forgive you or please forgive me or I forgive myself. That's a different thing. Sometimes uh, one of the people who's living can't say goodbye and can't face that the person they love is going to die. So that's a different thing. So again, this is all from my ritual background. And then of course there's when someone's died, what's happened? Are they moving as they need to through the journey? But in terms of kind of the, the quick three steps, if, if it happens tomorrow and you just need something in your back pocket, I would say the first is that as someone's dying, get prepared for the moment when they die because things change really quickly and it's a very tiny little window and you want to make sure that you walk through that doorway and live those hours and days right after that in a way that's fitting for you and your community and your family. And for some people, that's engaging the services of funeral home and doing what we might consider as a kind of traditional funeral. If that's the case, then make sure that's what you're prepared for. If you decide you want something different, make sure you're prepared for that because you can't think about it when someone's taking their last breath. Our brains go a little bit offline when that happens. It's just the natural part of that transformative cycle. So prepare and and no, I have a friend who says, the first thing you should do when someone dies is make a cup of tea. We have this sort of urgency because we don't know what to do with dead bodies. And we think maybe they have some kind of danger and they don't. And really the thing to do with them is be with them and make a cup of tea. And as much as you can, wherever you are, take time to adjust. Something enormous has happened and your soul needs to adjust. And the soul of the person who's died is adjusting. So I guess that would be the first thing is be prepared and know that you're allowed to take time, even if it's just an hour or two. Make that space. Another one is to um, honor that death is really hard and that nobody's going to do it the same way. And that people are allowed to meet it the way that they want to or that the way that they're able to or called to. So have a lot of space for people having different needs around death and try and find ways that help people get as present as possible to what's happening, but not closer than they're willing to. You can't push people. That's not healthy. It's not healing to push people closer than they want to be. You know, for instance, bringing a body home and keeping it at home for a couple of days. For some folks, that would be really healing. For others, it would not. It would maybe even damaging to them if they really didn't want to do it. So figure out what the balance is and try and make space for people to be present with. And ritual is a beautiful way to do that because we, we create these containers to actually experience the different places along the way. So as I say, it's, it's hard to give the quick answers, um, but, but those, are, those are sort of some general overviews. Um, Deanna says, how do I sign up for that? Deanna, I talked about the Calgary Holistic Death Network. If you go to my website, soulpassages.ca, um, you can find it under the events. We're taking a break for the summer. We start again in September. Alexandria, will you be coming to Winnipeg? And uh, I'm hoping to. I'm hoping to do some work uh, in Western Canada. 
the uh, Trump administration has made traveling to the U.S. to do this really difficult. So I'm pretty excited about staying in Western Canada and doing some teaching around that. What inspired you to take on this role? And thank you. Well, thanks, Alexander, for that. I talked a bit about what inspired me. I guess really what inspires me to do this as a practitioner is that I love truth in a way and I love realness. And when people are dying, facing the death of someone they love or someone just has died, all the surface layers of us comes away and people show up exactly as they are. There's a lot of love, there's a lot of grief, sometimes there's anger, it, sometimes it's messy, but it's all rooted in love and grief. And sometimes the messiness is just a top layer on that. You can peel that away, you get down to love and grief. And love and grief are so intertwined. They're two sides of the same ribbon. And being in places of deep grief, when you can make space for that grief, are also places of deep love. And it's just so nourishing to me to be in situations of really deep love. That's, I would say that's really what calls me to it. And that's what continues to feed me as I do it. Kat says an end of life concierge. Yes. And you know, that's another angle within the death midwifery movement, another aspect or wedge. And I, I actually, I think the New York Times might have had an article on someone like that. Someone I saw a while ago, that a concierge is a different kind of process. Maybe they're navigating the big process, helping families manage in different ways. Uh, you know, you could, you could think about expanding. What, what exactly does an end-of-life concierge does? Well, maybe they're making sure there's food on the table every night making sure your kids are getting to soccer games and that bigger process and helping you say, oh, yes, this is how you talk to a funeral home. And these are your options and these are the requirements and these are not required. And there's a kind of different kind of ombudsman. So certainly there are lots of possibilities. One of the other ones that I heard recently I thought was a good idea is we, um, older people who don't have children or younger friends to be there their agents or personal directive carriers, there's a possibility to set up a service of that. We have executive services that will execute, do the executoring on your will. Executoring? Execute? I'm not sure what the word is. So could we also set up services? We have to figure out how it's going to work. It has to be a long time commitment and some longevity built into that. But what if you could hire someone to be your personal agent if you didn't have people who could do it? Very different kind of death doula work, but possible. Okay, I'll roll back up and see if there are any other questions. Uh, yeah, I pop up any more questions if you have them. I'm hoping this is giving you a picture of the big breadth of what it is. And if you're curious about this, I really recommend you check out this course I've made. It's a short, downloadable, a video course. So it's not a participatory engagement course. It's just a delivery of a whole bunch of video information and links and resources that go deeper into the bigger picture of what death midwifery can be. And sorry, I just noticed that I still see we don't even have death concierge on the screen there. Uh, what death midwifery can be and different ways you can fit into it. Because lots of people contact me and they say, well, what about certification? What about training? What about legalities? So I address all of that in the course, in particular around training, because there are lots of great people offering death doula training or death midwife training. They're beautiful trainings, but they're a particular angle on it. And this death midwife training will not train you the same way this one does. And so you need to know before you go looking for a training what it actually is you want and what it is you need. So you may already have some skills and you need to increase them or you need to broaden them. But get really clear about where you're going before you take a particular training. And I talk again more about this in the course. It's really an overview to help people figure out what the next steps are. I don't teach how to do death midwifery. I teach how to um, 
uh, how to find your way through it. And Carrie Lee says, I just finished. Great. That's good. Thanks so much for that, Carrie Lee. Yeah, it's been really fun hearing from people about that. So I had a couple of questions, both Alicia and Jeremy. Alicia says, how do you charge? And Jeremy says, what's a reasonable amount to charge for services? Again, it goes back to what are you doing? And who are you and what's your expertise in it? So I have a lot of training. I have a PhD. I have been in holistic healing and the energy medicine training for many, many, many years. And what I do with people is it looks a little bit like counseling or therapy or spiritual direction. I mean, I'm not certified in any of those, but it's kind of what it looks like. People come and sit and we have a 90 minute session. And sometimes that's one person. Sometimes that's a group of people or a family. Sometimes I go to them. Sometimes it's by phone or Skype, but most of it is a kind of counseling process where I'm talking with a person or with a family and helping them really make meaning and find their way through the process they're meeting, or I'm facilitating rituals to, to do that. And so for that, I charge hourly, and my rate is much like what a counselor or a therapist would be. That's one particular angle. Other people, maybe, maybe you're coming and offering a palliative massage very specialized kind of massage. And then your prices would probably be more like what a massage therapist is. Maybe you're offering a consultation on the paperwork. There are a couple of women in Calgary who have a business offering support to healthy people who, who don't see death in their near future, but who want to think about what their funeral would be. So they work with them and they work with their family sometimes and they, they come up with a vision of what their funeral would be. And so they do a different kind of consulting. It's hourly, they're giving assignments, people are doing assignments when they come back. So the answer is there's no right answer to it. It You sort of have to figure out what what are you doing, what's it most like, and what's the pay scale and the, the hourly rate, if that's how you charge, it might not even be hourly, that is most like that. Again, lots of it depends. Alicia says, in your class, do you teach ritual? So the class, the course that I've been talking about, it's not a training. I don't say, when you meet a family, if this is happening, this is how you respond. It's not a training. It's, a, it's an informational download about the field. And I have one of the videos is fully about ritual and my work as a ritualist. And I tell a lot of stories about what I do. Really what the course does is says, here's the big field. Here are lots of different paths within it. Here are things you need to keep in mind. Here are things that I have discovered after being in practice that I wish I knew when I started about how to structure my practice, how to promote it, how to explain it to people. Here's this big thing. Here's a lot of links to different people who are doing different kinds of aspects of this so you can see what they're like. And then the last section is, and here's what I do. Here's the ritual aspect of it. So if this is what speaks to you, this gives you a window onto that. And there will be more practices and more teaching that follow about my specific angle on it. So I certainly do talk a bit about ritual, quite a bit about it, but I don't teach it. So I hope that, that answers that question. Let me just check in my notes here and see what else we've got going on. Um, yeah, any other, any other questions from folks? I think, I, I hope I've made it clear that, that this field is huge and we don't even know what it is yet, but that there's opportunity for lots of different angles within it, lots of different pathways, lots of different kinds of services. And it's, it's calling on the creative juices of everybody who's interested to start to create those. I you know when I, when I started doing this, I, I felt like, I was having to build the train tracks that the train was going to travel on. If I had decided I wanted to be a real estate agent, there's a pathway. You take this training, you promote yourself this way. This is how you do it. Enough people have done it. They know how to charge. There's percentages, there's commissions. Yet you have to learn to be a good real estate agent, but you don't have to figure out what a real estate agent is. In this work, we need to figure out what it is we're doing. 
and what the structures are for doing it, and how to describe it to people, and how to charge it for it, all of those things. I find it incredibly exciting, but it's important that people go into this aware that it is big and wide and it is not defined. And so people will find their way into it and we'll, we're, we're making the road as we walk on it. And again, that's, that's what this course is about. It's a deeper version of that, but I'm hoping I'm giving you some of that overview here. And it's, uh, here you go. oh, thanks very much. Carrie Lee says, you're a gracious vanguard. Thank you for all that you do. Well, I appreciate that. And I, you know, I have learned so much from the teachers who I've studied with. And I, I really feel this is a lineage practice that there are, there are wise ones. And as they become elders, they share their knowledge down. And I am so grateful to the people I've learned from and who have inspired me. It's pretty exciting for me to think that I can take what I've received from them comes through me and becomes a little bit shaped like me, and then I spread it out. And then further, that each of you who's listening will, again, take it further. I have a good friend who was really involved in the very first wave of birth midwifery. Lay midwives, before there was training, before there was certification, they were just, they were doing it really based in the deep ancient roots of it. And they were resurfacing that as a model within this society. And it's so exciting to talk to her about this because so many parallels can be found between this reemerging of reclaiming our relationship with death. Reclaiming our relationship with death, reclaiming our relationship with dying people because they're often excluded and isolated. It can be very lonely to die in this culture and reclaiming our relationship with our dead. So there's a whole new model coming up, and it's about family-based. We're bringing the decisions down to as low as they can be brought. Instead of making decisions and having the actions done at really high institutional levels, we're bringing it as low down as possible. And the birth midwifery did the same thing. They said, medicine is really important, but it's in service to the family and soul process of birth. And so we're saying the same thing. We're saying... Medical services are so critical. Funeral services can be really valuable. There are times when we really need funeral directors in our cultures, in our communities, because we're not equipped to deal with the kinds of deaths and bodies that sometimes happen. We really need to honor and respect that. And there are other ways to engage that are more family-based. And we need to spread that out. So I get quite inspired about about who I've learned from and how it's moving through me and how those of us and those ahead of me and who will continue are going to grow this and where we'll be in 10 years or 20 or 30. Yeah, it, I, I find it really moving. So Reiki says, I love this topic and helping those in such a time, yes, can be a huge benefit in time of death. Deanna says, trailblazing doulas. There you go. That sounds like a country and Western movie. <laughs> That's great. It is. It's trailblazing. It's, it's creating a new path. And I want people to be clear about that because it's hard work. It's a big project. We're, we're, we're doing something that hasn't been done. And you need a lot of different skills and you need a lot of support and community around it. One thing is knowing how to do your art. If you're a uh, Reiki practitioner who works with dying people, and you are just incredible when your hands are on someone. That's part of it. But we also need tools for you to be able to get that out to people. So it's, it's a big picture. I think there's enormous opportunity there. And it's important that people have a realistic view of what it is. It's this, and it's growing, and it's grown so much. In the last four years, my practice has gone through a huge transformation just because the the cultural context is shifting. It's growing and it's growing quickly. It's really boomers that are growing it, but it is growing. It's not a thing yet, but it's becoming a thing. Linda says, in the UK, I really feel that families don't know how to deal with the death of their families. I'd love to help change that. So clearly said, that's it. We just don't know. You know, I heard a beautiful uh, image that in the Victorian times, sex was taboo didn't talk about sex. 
and suddenly a couple gets married and they're on their marriage bed and suddenly they have to navigate sex and they don't know anything about it. Rough, right? That's a hard place to be in. Now we understand sex is a normal human experience. There are ways to do it. There are ways to communicate it. There are ways to be healthy about it and understand our own boundaries and consent. We have a whole um, understanding of what sexual health is and how to live as a sexually healthy person, whatever your sexual activities are. So, but in Victorian England, they didn't have that. Well, now we're starting to say, well, death is a normal part of life. And right now we're sending people to die or to support their dying family members with no resources. It's like that couple on their marriage bed 150 years ago. That's changed. This can change. And uh, I hope this is really a rallying cry to that, that we need all sorts of different creativity and we need all sorts of different kinds of people offering different kinds of things to different kinds of communities. And out of that, we'll develop a new cultural literacy around death and dying. I'm going to wrap up there. Robin says, thank you for sharing your wisdom and your medicine, sister. Well, thank you very much. It's been a real gift to have such a great turnout on this. I'm really glad to see folks here. And again, uh, I'll add the link to the course in the comments, and I'll also add the link to the um, blog post about the work you did with my dad, because I think you'd enjoy that. And if you're watching the replay, I'm sorry you couldn't have been with here with us here in person, but do post your comments, and I'll certainly get back and respond to them. And if you have any other questions about the course or about anything else, I'll also post my website in there, and I'd love to hear from you. Many thanks, many thanks. All right. So uh, we'll sign off now, and thanks for being here. I really appreciate your interest, and uh, I hope to stay in touch.